Om Namo Bhagavate Sivanandaya. Our topic for this morning, scriptures and the transforming power of Swadhyaya and stories from our scriptures. One bright and sunny morning, a group of boys gathered in a forest clearing on the banks of a river. But these were no ordinary boys. They were the youth of the mighty Kaurava and Pandava clans, and they had come to the clearing under the instruction of Dronacharya. Dronacharya was a military expert and their guru in the art of warfare and weaponry. Dronacharya was a strict taskmaster. He addressed his pupils by saying, Just as a porter learns to shape a clay pot, the hero learns to shape his mind. One morning, Dronacharya decided to set up a competition to test the concentration of the boys. He hung up a small wooden bird in a tree across the river. The instruction given to the boys was to aim an arrow and hit the eye of the bird. No mean feat, but certainly a worthy test for the sons of kings and gods. The eldest, Yudhishthira, was first invited. Taking position by his teacher, he crouched slightly and drew his bowstring taut. Can you see the bird properly? Tell me everything you can see, Yudhishthira, said Dronacharya. Wanting to be thorough, Yudhishthira began to list off everything that met his eyes. I see the wooden bird with red wings, the branch and the tree laden with fruit. I can see the leaves moving and even more birds sitting on the same tree. I can see the river, the grass, other trees, the sky. Like this, Yudhishthira continued to name everything he could think of. When he finished, he waited for his master's final command to shoot. But Drona merely said, Put down your bow and take a seat, Yudhishthira. You will not hit the eye of the bird. The next boy was called forward and asked the same question by Drona. He gave a similar answer, naming everything he could see. Once again, the boy was told to put away his bow. This same pattern continued with every boy that followed. Until finally, Dronacharya called upon Arjuna. Which way is the river flowing? asked Drona. I do not know, replied Arjuna. I can only see the eye of the bird. What color is the bird? I do not know, said Arjuna. I can only see the eye of the bird. What fruit is hanging from the tree branch? on which the bird is perched, asked Drona. I do not know, replied Arjuna. I can only see the eye of the bird. Drona gave the instruction for Arjuna to shoot his arrow. With a loud twang, the arrow sprang from the bow straight into the bird's eye, a perfect shot. The bird fell with a small thud and all the boys looked in amazement at Arjuna. From this short story, we learn not the secrets of skilled archery, but rather that it is tremendous and unwavering focus that leads to success. Whatever task is in front of us, in that moment, it should receive our complete single-pointed attention. Distractions and multitasking should be avoided. Summarized in the following analogy of our Divine Master. If you focus the rays of the sun through the lens, they can burn cotton or a piece of paper. 
but the scattered rays cannot do this act. Heroes cultivate a meditative mind. A master archer does not see the obstacles in the way of hitting the bird's eye. He sees with clarity the goal beyond the obstacles. Heroes take on challenges and solve persistent problems by increasing their awareness. Like Arjuna, we too have to become aware that the powers that reside within us are much greater than the challenges in front of us. Mastery of Ekagrata, the power of single-pointed concentration, is the answer to achieving heroic goals in all aspects of our lives. The story comes from the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, created by the sage Vyas. Sri Swami Sivananda says in his book, Satsanga and Swadhyaya, if you reflect on the ideas given in spiritual books, it inspires and elevates the mind. It reduces wandering of the mind. Vikshepa. Vikshepa was a folly of Yudhishthira and the boys in the story. Now, isn't it easier for us to remember and assimilate the lesson of Arjuna and the bird's eye as opposed to a dull instruction that the human brain cannot perform two tasks that require high-level brain function at once. You probably have already forgotten the last sentence I said, yet the information was as important and the lesson was the same. Such indirect instruction, particularly done in a way that the person doesn't know that he or she is being taught, works better and addresses the very core of our being. Wisdom can easily be placed in seed form within simple narratives that anyone can appreciate. Curiosity compels us to ponder upon their meaning, while mere speculative philosophy has little value to communicate and inspire us. The Srimad Bhagavata and Sri Swami Sivananda's inspiring stories are presented in narrative form, each with a rhetoric at the end of the story. Our ancient sages and Brahma Vidya gurus knew of this and therefore it is one of the fundamental precepts of Hinduism. Swadhyaya, the transforming power of Swadhyaya and scriptures is part of our topic for today. On Swadhyaya, Sri Swami Sivananda says, one of the most effective ways is by reading spiritual literature, attending satsang, listening to and reading messages given by them, and also the reading of the lives of great saints and sages. Sadhana, is what you do to unite with the divine, says the mother of Sri Aurobindo Ashram. Swadhyaya, as a sadhana, has been made a compulsory part of daily routine by Sri Swami Savananda and Sri Swami Sahajananda. Our modern saints, in all their compassion and love, have succeeded in translating most of our scriptures into a language we can read and understand. Lofty principles have been written in a simple and lucid style by Sri Swami Svananda. Satsang, discourses, dramatization programs in yoga camp and Sunday school also serve as an ideal forum to perpetuate valuable lessons from our scriptures. Hinduism is also known by the names Sanatana Dharma and Vedika Dharma. Sanatana Dharma means eternal religion and Vedika Dharma means religion of the Vedas. Hinduism is as old as the world itself. 
Hinduism is the mother of all religions. Sanatana Dharma is protected by God. Vedika Dharma means the religion of the Vedas. The Vedas are the foundational scriptures of Hinduism. Dharma is the principle of righteousness. The whole world is sustained by God. Practice of Dharma requires of us, therefore, the recognition and abidance by it. That which helps to unite and develop divine love and universal brotherhood is Dharma. On the other hand, that which creates disharmony, split and foments hatred is our Dharma. The practice of Dharma alone is the gateway to moksha, to immortality, to supreme peace. However, what is Dharma in one set of circumstances becomes our Dharma in another set of circumstances. That is the reason why it is said that the secret of Dharma is extremely profound and subtle. Lord Krishna says in the Gita, Let the scriptures be the authority in determining what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. Knowing what hath been declared by the ordinances of the scriptures, thou ought to work in this world. Chapter 16, verse 24 The ancient rishis and sages of India have expressed their intuitive spiritual experiences in the Vedas. These experiences are direct and infallible. Hinduism regards the spiritual experiences of the rishis of yore as its authority. The priceless truths that have been revealed by the Hindu rishis and sages through millennia constitute the glory of Hinduism. Therefore, Hinduism is a revealed religion. Our master writes, The Vedas are the oldest books in the library of man. The truths contained in all religions are derived from the Vedas and are ultimately traceable to the Vedas. The Vedas are the ultimate source to which all religious knowledge can be traced. Religion is of divine origin. It was revealed by God to man in the earliest times and it is protected in the Vedas. The Upanishads are the essence of the Vedas. The Upanishads speak of the identity of the individual soul and the Supreme Soul. They reveal the most subtle and deep spiritual truths. Next in importance is the Shruti, also the Smritis or secondary scriptures. The Shruti and the Smritis are the two authoritative sources of Hinduism. Shruti literally means that which is heard and Smriti means that which is remembered. Shruti is a revelation and Smriti is tradition. Upanishad is a Shruti. Bhagavad Gita is a Smriti. Shruti is direct experience. We will now talk about the Itihasas. There are four books under this heading. The Valmiki Ramayana, the Yoga Vashista, the Mahabharata and the Harivamsa. These embody all that which is in the Vedas, but only in a simpler manner. These works explain the great universal truths in the form of historical narratives, stories and dialogues. These are very interesting volumes and are liked by all, from the inquisitive child to the intellectual scholar. The Valmiki Ramayana expounds the excellences of Sri Rama, the epitome of Dharma, the Mariada Purusha. The Master says that the Ramayana is living Dharma 
in theory and practice. It is perhaps easiest to incorporate the Itiyasas into our daily sadhana or swadhyaya because the Itiyasas give us beautiful stories of absorbing interest and importance through which all the fundamental teachings of Hinduism are indelibly impressed on one's mind. The cream of the Upanishads is the Bhagavad Gita, that eternal song sung by Lord Krishna to Arjuna to the whole world. This is sung within the context of that great epic, the Mahabharata. From the Gita, we get an understanding of what is man. To the Westerner, man is a physical creation endowed with a mind. To the Hindu, man is a soul having a body. His innermost nature is God. The body is an instrument of the soul. The body is a temple of that radiant and self-effulgent Atman, the true nature of man. The central teachings of the Gita are the attainment of the beatitude of life. This is the goal of life. True life, says Sri Swami Savananda, is the identification with this supreme soul to realize this self-luminous Atman, this Satchidananda, which is hidden in the body as butter is hidden in milk. The study of the Gita alone is sufficient for daily Swadhyaya, that is scriptural study. We reach out to the Gita for help to find a solution for all doubt and misery in the world. The more you study it with devotion and faith, deeper knowledge, penetrative insight and clear right thinking will be yours. The transformative power of the Gita is best given by Sri Swami Svananda in the following analogy. If the philosopher's stone touches a piece of iron at one point, the whole of it is transformed into gold. Even so, if you live in the spirit of even one verse of the Gita, you will doubtless be transmuted into divinity. It is not within the scope of this presentation to cover all scriptures. The poem by Sri Swami Svadanda gives us an insight into the wide range of Hindu scriptures. Vedas, Puranas and Kavyas. They command you to lead a divine life. They do not use argument or persuasion. Puranas are like a good friend. They plead with you to do right. Using various arguments and illustrating them with interesting stories. Kavyas are like the life divine and lure you into life divine. Each one has its own place and is suited to a particular temperament. It should be noted that Swadhyaya also includes the study of books, messages and talks by the Guru. Works like the Tirukural, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Abhyangas of Tukaram, the Periya Puranam, the Tevarum, the Ramayana and all that which elevates the mind and turns it towards thoughts of God also fall under the practice of this sadhana. Why is daily study of the scriptures so important? Study of scriptures by our saints and sages bearing the sacred truths must never be given up at whatever stage of spiritual evolution. Repetition gives strength. Repetition of daily swadhyaya pushes the idea into the innermost chambers of your heart and mind. Then the ideas will become active in your subconscious mind. You may not even know what wonders have been effected upon you. Such is the influence of daily swadhyaya. 
The practice of daily swadhyaya prevents any backsliding. All around us, we are surrounded by hostile forces. If you relax from this disciplined practice, these hostile forces will find an opportunity to play havoc in your lives. Swami Sahajananda once said that books may be kept at your bedside as an aspirant is certain to experience the spiritual vibrations emanating from them. How does one practice Swadhyaya? Some of the guidelines taken from the writings and the commentaries of the mother of Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Paramhamsa Yogananda and Sri Swami Sivananda aid us as regards to how we should approach, read, listen and make a study of the scriptures or perform Swadhyaya effectively. The safe route, therefore, to proceed in your spiritual path is to follow the direction of a guru established in the Absolute. Before you begin to actually read, make salutations and prostrations to your guru. Offer prayers to Lord Ganesha and Mother Saraswati. Slowly and with complete attention, read either a verse or a page, if possible at a set time when one is calm and the mind is still. We are further advised to make repeated readings of that which was already read. Over time, the truth within the words of the text builds its power to influence and transform the person who reads it and sincerely strives for it. Our Master asks of us to resist the temptation to cavil and carp. This term refers to attempts by the reader to find contradictions or discrepancies in a scriptural text. The correct way to approach our scriptures requires patience, humility and recognizing our own limitations in the ability to understand. We are reminded that when you study spiritual books, you are in tune with the authors who are saints. This means reading the book Swami Sivananda in pictures is having satsang with Swami Sivananda. Similarly, with the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the readings of the Srimad Bhagavatam leaves you in the company of the great Rishi Vyasa. Mother of Sri Aurobindo says that when reading, one should sense that they are receiving something through a special movement within. At this point, it is useful to stop and to meditate on what you read. By the act of meditation, you are raising your mind to God. Gurudev suggests that we keep a notebook at hand. Record that which served to inspire you. A sentiment, a lesson, or an instruction that penetrates, or as the saints say, entered your consciousness. Rereading that which you record from the scripture will help to entrench it within you. Note that any inquiry into the meaning of scriptures will remain incomplete and sterile unless it is grounded in the fundamental quality and attitude of Shraddha. Shraddha refers to faith. Our Rishis have emphasized that the first and foremost qualification required for any spiritual sadhana, Swadhyaya included, is faith. The word Shraddha encompasses a range of meanings, reverence, humility, spiritual conviction and the capacity and willingness to act according to our deepest convictions. Listen to a simple story demonstrating the magnificent power of pure, devoted faith as given in the booklet Faith and Self-Surrender by Sri Swami Sivananda. Once, 
a milkmaid regularly supplied milk to an ascetic. However, she could not supply the milk on time as the river was in flood. On hearing of the reason for the delay, the ascetic chided her, saying, Lady, people cross the ocean of worldliness by always chanting the divine name. The lady of pure and innocent heart took it to mean that she could cross the flooded river by merely chanting the divine name. Thereafter, she was never late any more. One day, the ascetic questioned her as to how she was always on time in spite of the river being in flood. He was told by the milkmaid that she carried out his instruction by chanting the divine name. This made it possible for her to walk across even when the river was in flood. The ascetic was surprised and could not believe this. He asked her to demonstrate this feat. In all faith and innocence, she walked over the raging waters, chanting the divine name, requesting the ascetic to follow her. The ascetic, too, began to repeat the name and stepped on the waters. However, his feet began to sink and hastily retreated to the shore. The reason for his failure is quite evident. He did not have that simple and childlike faith. Such is the power of faith to elevate any sadhana or action. Therefore, when performed in the correct manner with faith, a marvellous change can take place in our hearts. If we listen to or read the stories of God's glory and power in our scriptures, even in the lives of our modern saints, there are incidents which are meant to emphasize the transformative power of the scriptures. This morning session will be incomplete if it fails to draw your attention to the deep aspiration set aflame by the study of scriptures. It was the scriptures which set alight a burning flame in some of our great saints. Kupasami, a medical doctor in Malaysia, was given a book to read by one of his patients, Swami Sachidananda. Brahma Aikya Vedanta Rahasyam was the name of the book. The reading of the book, accompanied by listening to the Shruti, Yadhareva Virjit Tadhareva Pravrijit. This means the day on which one gets Vairagya, that very day one should renounce the world. Kupasami gave up his career, left behind a life of ease and luxury and set off immediately to India to lead a life of a medicant. It was during this period that God came to Sivananda in the form of an all-consuming aspiration to realize God as a self in all. After much austerities, meditation and contemplation, Sri Swami Sivananda was graced with the ultimate God-realization. Sri Swami Sahajananda picked up a book in a Vedic bookshop in Durban. The name of the book was Practice of Karma Yoga. His deep longing and devotion to God was set in motion. He chose as his guru Sri Swami Savananda, the author of this book. The sacrifice of career in the pursuit of his deep aspiration earned for him the grace of bliss and enlightenment. Sri Aurobindo, a great saint, was confined to solitary imprisonment. He was given books, amongst which was the Gita. It was after an intellectual understanding and meditation on the Upanishads and the Gita that he experienced 
the bliss of a spiritual awakening. The prison walls ceased to appear as a prison. All that was around him vibrated with the universal consciousness. He saw divinity in the prison warder and had the vision of Lord Krishna playing the flute. Such is the transformative influence of our scriptures. For the ordinary man, scriptures also act as a consoling companion under vexing circumstances, as a guiding light in the night of darkness and folly, and finally as a panacea for evils. In conclusion, we end with the following important and relevant verses from Guru Bhakti Yoga by Sri Swami Svananda. All scriptures emphatically declare the necessity for a guru. Study of sacred scriptures without service to the guru is only a waste of time. Study of holy scriptures from guru without giving guru dakshina to him is only a waste of time. We offer our prostrations and salutations at the feet of all the saints and sages whose incarnations were dedicated to passing on the spiritual truths of the scriptures to mankind for our benefit and evolution. We prostrate with profound gratitude to our master, Sri Swami Savananda, whose mission was the dissemination of spiritual literature and thereby made even the most intellectual and academic of scriptures accessible and understandable to all. Through daily study and practice, may we all discover the divine within. Hari Om Tatsa. Om Namo Bhagavate Shivanandaya. Our greetings to all spiritual darlings, their parents and grandparents who have joined us in this online morning yoga camp presentation. Hari Om. Our topic today is Heart of Compassion and the readings are taken from the Compassion series and Divine Life for Children by Sri Swami Shivananda. As we read in Divine Life for Children, the Divine Master, Sri Swami Shivananda, had immense love for children. They too loved him affectionately. Bearing in mind the importance of their education and welfare, he prepared lessons especially for them. Pujiswami Sahajananda has printed the Compassion series which contains delightful animal stories and fascinating notes on natural science. When we read these books, a reverence for life, a love and compassion for all living creatures grows in the hearts of adults and children alike. Spiritual Darlings, today we will share with you some stories from our books. Savitri, do you remember the story Bachan's Diwali? Yes, the story goes like this. Bachan's Diwali Bachan is the name I gave to my little donkey. He is just a year old, so I have to take great care of him. Wash him, brush him, and feed him. Bachan loves me. He never kicks me. In fact, he never kicks anyone, because I do not allow anyone to tease him. My father told me that if we are kind to our pets and do not trouble them, they behave very nicely. If we are rough to them, they also turn out rough. Last Diwali, I had a bad time. Since then, I am very careful where I take my pet. This is what happened. My father worked for Bara Sahib, who had two sons, Ajay and Vijay, who were always very smartly dressed, and had a kind younger sister, Jaya. But after Diwali night, I took a dislike to their smartness. We had at home a few sweets and fireworks, which finished quickly and my dad took me to Bara Sahib's home to go watch the fireworks. I asked my dad, May I take Bachan with us also? 
My dad looked a little thoughtful and then replied, Donkeys do not enjoy fireworks, but there's no harm if you keep Bachan close to you. Marvelous patterns of fire fill the air, and stars of different colors shot up like fountains. Rivers of silver and gold flowed into the darkness. Night was turned into day. Every now and then crackers burst, and Bachan shivered with fear. I put my arms around his neck and held him tightly. He did not try to run or bray because he trusted me. He knew that no harm could come to him as long as I was by his side. After a while, the noise died down. I then noticed the two boys whispering something to each other and pointing towards Bachan and me, smiling. I thought they were admiring my pet. They came up to me and said, Will you let us have your donkey for a while? We want to play with him. I gladly handed over the rope. The little girl gave Bachan some sweets. Suddenly, I heard terrible noise of crackers exploding, and with it, the terrible braying of Bachan. He howled piteously, then followed loud laughter. I ran up the steps, and what I saw and felt are hard to describe. Bachan was jumping and kicking as if he'd gone mad. Then I saw a tin can dangling from his tail. Loud noise and sparks came out of the can. I was horrified. So this was the mean trick they had planned. I too felt like kicking them. Bachan, I screamed as I rushed up to him and cut off the strings with my teeth. Sparks of fire burnt my face, but I did not care. I put my arms around Bachan and sobbed, as did the little girl sobbing loudly and asking why the two boys were so wicked. Their father came out, and when he heard the story, he looked very sternly at his sons and said, Look, boys, Diwali is a festival of joy for everyone. You cannot enjoy yourself if you hurt others. Animals are our friends, and you should care for them. Jokes are no jokes if they give pain. The next day, while I was feeding Bachan, Ajay and Vijay came. They said we are sorry and held out their hands. We made friends. I am glad to say that Bachan also forgave them and allowed them to feed and stroke him. And I am also glad that the two boys said that they were sorry and it's a lesson for us all. Now let's talk more about our compassion books. Sri Gurudev wrote the books on compassion to inculcate in the hearts of all reverence for life and respect and compassion for all living creatures. Animals, birds, insects and plants are closely linked to ecology. Their protection and preservation are needed for the survival of human beings. Many birds, animals, flowers and plants are on the endangered list. To protect animals and their rights are man's duty, as this goes hand in hand with our protection of nature. Since animals cannot speak for themselves, it is our duty to do so on their behalf. Sometimes we are busy with our schoolwork, homework and helping at home, such that we forget to notice and protect the animal world around us. Spiritual darlings and adults should inculcate this trait of compassion. We read in Sri Gurudev's book, Heart of Compassion, about the wonders of nature. Children, have you watched the behavior of ants? Ants are small, active creatures moving about here and there in search of food. If a piece of jaggery or sugar is placed on the floor, and if one observes, the intelligent behavior of ants can be noticed. When an ant observes a bit of food material, it behaves in a strange manner. Instead of beginning to eat it, it runs around the food, climbs up and down it, runs backwards and forwards, and exhibits peculiar movements. It appears as though it were trying to learn the exact measurements and location of the food. After having a clear idea of the nature, 
quantity and location of the food. The ant then runs here and there to pass on the information quickly to the other ants of the nest. Interesting, isn't it? Yes. And have you seen two ants meet on the way? They stop for some time and touch each other with their hair-like antennas. Perhaps by this act, the first ant passes on the entire information about the food to the other ant. Both of them run hither and thither, and the information is spread to other ants. In a short while, hundreds of ants can be seen moving in a row towards the food. Isn't that an amazing observation of one of God's tiniest of creatures? Their general rule appears to be one for all and all for one. The food collected by one is shared by all. The difficulty of one member of the colony of ants is felt by all the ants. Yes, I agree. Don't we as human beings have much to learn from birds, animals and insects? We certainly do. Also in our book, Heart of Compassion, we read about experiments done on animals in laboratories. The scientists seek new information about diseases and cures. However, as J.P. Vasvani says, the experiments bring untold torture to innocent animals. Monkeys, guinea pigs and other creatures are traumatized and suffer untold misery. They are made to endure terrible pain. We must not forget that knowledge is not knowledge which is acquired through cruel means. For research to be a blessing to humanity, it should not be through the torture of helpless creatures. True knowledge comes from compassion. Yes, we read of Bhagwan Ramana's compassion also. Every visitor to Bhagwan Ramana Maharishi's ashram was struck by the way in which he dealt with animals, especially those living in the ashram. He would say, Lakshmi has come, give her rice food at once, looking out the window, and the visitor would think that some girl had to be given a meal. But soon a cow would step in, answering to the name Lakshmi. He again would ask, have the boys been given their food? Maybe there are little boys living in the ashram or come out for a visit, one would think. But presently, a few dogs would answer the call of a whistle and each would be given his plate full of rice. He was careful about their comfort, cleanliness, baths and bed and affectionately called them boys or children of the ashram. Just as children are given their food first, these dogs, as well as the cats and cows were served meals and sweets first. Thereafter, the bigger guests and inmates of the ashram and lastly Bhagwan took their meals. Such was Bhagwan Ramana Maharishi's heart of compassion. An example for us to learn such compassion for our animal pets and friends. Many of us were blessed to have seen our dear Pujaswamiji's love for animals, especially the dog Bhaktas, who were given special delicious butter biscuits made especially for Arjuna, Karana, Bhima, Pakti, Shakti and the rest. In the book Call of Compassion, we are asked, should children have pets? Sri Gurudev says, love soon grows in the heart of a child who tends to his dog because the dog keeps its love on the child. They become close companions, sharing the joys and sorrows of each other as good friends always do. It strengthens the child's feeling of responsibility for those weaker than himself. Sri Gurudev says, the unstinted love a dog bestows upon his master is one of life's richest gifts. Let the responsible child have his pet if it is a cat, rabbit, a bird, that is his affair. If he loves the creature, it is all that is necessary. 
And what of animal mothers? Another reason why we can never hurt or harm an animal is because it has a mother who cares for it. Animal mothers take their responsibility just as seriously as humans. Just as your mom takes care of you, dear spiritual darlings, so does the animal mom. From the day her young are born, the animal mother's primary job is that of protecting her offspring. Let us watch this video of loving mums and babies in the animal world. We conclude with a prayer for animals. O oh, all merciful Lord, shower thy grace and blessings upon all the dumb, helpless creatures on this earth, especially those that are cruelly slaughtered, that are used in vivisections, that are caught in traps, and that are killed in sport and animal sacrifices. O oh, all merciful protector, bless all the plants and flowers, the oceans and the rivers, the waterfalls and mountains, the valleys and landscapes that proclaim thy glory, majesty, beauty on this earth. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Hari Om, dear camp participants. Thank you for tuning into our yoga camp online lessons. Please note that satsang will commence at 11 a.m. and a WhatsApp link will be sent to you shortly. Oh.